Okay, so today we're going to talk about anemia. Uh, specifically, we're going to just talk about what happens in anemia, and then we're going to talk about the different types of anemia, like sickle cell anemia, per pernicious anemia, folic acid deficiency anemia, and iron de deficiency anemia. So let's talk about anemia to begin with. Anemia begins with a decrease in the number of red blood cells. So since you have less red blood cells or less carrying capacity of those red blood cells, there's going to be less oxygen that can get to the body. So when a body part is not receiving enough oxygen, there's going to obviously be pain. So that is one of the first things that we can talk about as a symptom of anemia, that there's going to be pain. Obviously there's going to be a hypoxia because there's going to be decreased oxygen getting to the body part, but the primary thing is that the, the patient is going to feel pain. They could also have orthostatic hyper, hypotension. They could have thready pulses, so very weak pulses. There could be an increased heart rate, amenorrhea, so the lack of menstruation. They could have chest discomfort, difficulty concentrating, increased breaths. Remember, since they are not receiving enough oxygen, their body's gonna try to compensate for this by increasing their respirations. Uh, they could also have dyspnea. They could be put into an acidotic state. They could have a headache because of that lack of oxygen. Vertigo, they could have pallor, which would be like, I mean, because of the decreased oxygen getting to their extremities. They could also have constipation and decreased bowel sounds. So the risk factors that go along with anemia primarily are blood loss. So if somebody's in a car accident and they lose a lot of blood, they could be put into an anemic state. Patients who also, I mean, when we get specifically into like iron deficiency anemia, patients who aren't eating enough iron, like don't consume enough iron in their diet, so possibly vegetarians who don't eat red meat or some vegans along, that's going to be pernicious anemia. But pe people who don't eat enough iron in their diet, they could be put into an anemic state. This could also, uh, they could also have anemia because of an inadequate or an abnormal like red blood cell production in their body. So they could possibly have kidney problems or if they could have liver issues because there's decreased storage of the proteins that are needed to make the red blood cells. So there's different types of anemia. We're going to get into these more specifically in a second. But there's iron deficiency anemia, pernicious anemia, folic acid anemia, and sickle cell anemia. Uh, when you're evaluating these patients, there's going to be different things that you can test for. Obviously, you're going to do a CBC and you can see if they have a decreased number of red blood cells, a decreased H&H, &H, and please forgive me for how crappy that looks right there with that really sad little decreased arrow and that really weird looking H. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, their total iron binding capacity could be down, their iron level obviously will be down, and their ferritin level will be down as well. So there are different nursing interventions for an anemic patient. One is a blood transfusion. Obviously, if your patient has lost a lot of blood because of a car accident or because of surgery, they're going to be getting a blood transfusion most likely. Uh, nutritional intervention is another one. This is primarily for those people that have like an iron deficiency anemia or folic acid, possibly pernicious anemia. Uh, IV fluids to replace the volume. Remember, if they lose a lot of blood volume, they could be put into a uh, fluid deficit situation so you can start giving them IV fluids. Uh, supplements, specifically iron, folic acid, and B12. Again, we're going to get into those specific anemias in a moment. Uh, obviously give them oxygen. I mean, if they're having issues getting oxygen in their cells, then go ahead and give them a little oxygen to help them get more. Uh, you want to put them in a warm environment because they're most likely going to be cold and then bed rest. So that's the specific things for anemia. Now we're going to get into the different specific anemias. So the first one is iron deficiency anemia. I'm gonna hold this back, but I'm gonna zoom in so y'all can see it. So these are some risk factors. So iron deficiency anemia can happen with like blood loss. Remember like a person in a car accident, like a trauma, or even their menstrual cycle. That's what's written right there. Zoom in for y'all. They could have poor GI absorption. So like if somebody has had surgery to remove a large portion of their small intestine, they could have issues because they're not able to absorb the iron that is in their diet. They could have an inadequate diet. They could uh, have iron deficiency anemia because of alcoholism or even pregnancy. So with iron deficiency anemia, there's a decreased iron supply, which is needed for the red blood cells. So adults usually have between two to six grams of iron in their cells. So if they have something less than that, then they could be put into an iron deficiency anemic state. Red blood cells are small, they're micro, 
Cytic, I guess that's how you say it. I don't really know. But the symptoms of iron deficiency anemia include weakness, pallor, fatigue, decreased exercise tolerance, fissures like uh, little cracks at the corners of their mouths, ferritin values are going to be less than 10, normal is like 12 to 300. These patients will also feel cold, have an increased heart rate, and they'll have dyspnea with minor exertion. So when you in when you evaluate these patients, their increase when you increase their iron intake, it may cause GI distress. So you need to like evaluate their GI discomfort level, I guess. You need to take a CBC to see their their red blood cell count and their H and H, as well as their total iron binding capacity, their iron level, and their ferritin value. You can take a stool sample and then send them to endoscopy endoscopy, I think that's how you say it. This is looking for GI bleed or occult blood. And you could even do a bone marrow aspiration where you'd, you'd be looking for cancer in their bones. So uh, normal uh, drug therapy or like, evalu like interventions for this patient would obviously be giving them iron solutions. So like iron dextrin or furomoxetol. I don't know if I said that right, but I'll hold it right there for you to see. Those are different drug therapies that you can offer them. And of course, there are different like uh, considerations that you need to know. Like if you're giving a patient like something orally, you wanna make sure that they have it with a straw. If you can, have your patient take it with uh, vitamin C or like orange juice because that'll help increase the body's ability to absorb it. You want them to avoid antacids because that can actually interfere with the absorption of the iron. And you want them to either take this 30 minutes before their meals or two hours after, just so that the body has enough time to properly absorb it. Uh, for patients who are taking an iron supplement, you're gonna want them to increase their fi fiber intake and their fluid intake. This is to help prevent constipation. And like we said earlier, take their, have them take their iron with vitamin C, because vitamin C increases the absorption of iron. Uh, they can also increase their iron in their diet, so like dark leafy green vegetables have a lot of iron in them, beans, organ meat, which just sounds delicious, but they could eat more organ meat. They could also eat raisins, so if I had to choose between raisins and organ meat, I think I would choose raisins. I mean, that's pretty easy. And I mean, patients could also receive a blood transfusion, but that's obviously just in the hospital. So those are the different things for iron deficiency anemia. Here's the page. And those are the risk factors. Remember blood loss from like trauma or even a menstrual cycle, poor GI absorption. So like if they have issues with their small intestine or if they've had a large portion of their small intestine removed, that could be it. Here are symptoms. Remember they do have an increased heart rate. These are evaluation considerations. So like remember that if they increase iron in their diet, they may have GI distress, like if they increase iron like with a supplement. I mean, obviously they could have GI distress if they're increasing their iron in their diet with organ meat, but we're not gonna talk about organ meat anymore. <laughs> okay, the next type of anemia we're gonna talk about is folic acid. This is usually like a deficiency of folic acid in the diet. So deficient diet, they could have malabsorption. So like if they have Crohn's disease or another issue with the absorption of, of uh, nutrients in their body, like if they don't have their small intestine anymore or something, just malabsorption in general. Uh, we also have oral contraceptives, anticonvulsants, and methotrexate. Those are different drugs that the patient may be on that could also interfere with the folic acid absorption in their body. So for symptoms for folic acid, anem folic acid anemia, they could have pallor, jaundice, fatigue, and weight loss, but their nervous system remains normal. That's something you need to remember with folic acid. This is because folic acid does not affect the nerve function right there. See, it's sideways. So those are their symptoms, but it's not neurologic. There's other anemias that could have neurologic symptoms, so just that's a fun thing to remember. There are risk groups that of uh, people who are more likely to have folic acid deficiency anemia. So older patients who possibly have alcoholism, malnutrition, again, we were talking about that, and then those who have increased folic acid requirements. This could be like a pregnant woman. You know how uh, pregnant women are, inc are encouraged to take a folic acid supplement. They could be anemic, but that's one of those things they gotta talk to their doctor about. 
Uh, this is typically managed with a folic acid replacement therapy, so one of those supplements. And they could also increase their diet with dark leafy green vegetables, dried beans, liver, one of those organ meats, yeast, citrus, and nuts. So there's not too, too much about folic acid, but it is something to remember that folic acid anemia does not have any neurologic effects. So, yay. And you could eat that organ meat and you could eat that liver and get you some folic acid, but I'm not going to do that. Okay, so the next anemia we're going to talk about is pernicious anemia. Now, pernicious anemia is the failure to absorb B12 in the body, but there is an anemia where... So there's two different anemias that we can talk about regarding B12. There's people who do not produce B12 in their body. Those people have pernicious anemia. And then there are people who are not getting enough B12 in their body. Like their body makes it, but they're not, they're, they're, okay, wait, let me start over. Let me start over. B, in order for a body to absorb B12, they have to have intrinsic factor. So just disregard what I said a moment ago. In order for a body to absorb B12 in their body, they have to have intrinsic factor. People who have pernicious anemia do not have that intrinsic factor. These people lack it. They need to have it supplemented. They actually get an injection in their abdomen to give them that intrinsic factor so they can absorb vitamin B12. Then you have the people that lack B12 in their diet altogether. These are typically vegans because B12 is found in a lot of like animal products. So there are some vegans that actually take like an organic, vegan-friendly B12 supplement. So there's two different things that we're talking about here. The, in order for any human body to absorb vitamin B12, you have to have intrinsic factor. Let's pretend intrinsic factor is this. Vegans have this. So over here, I'm a vegan and I have this intrinsic factor. I just don't have the correct stuff in my diet to absorb the uh, B12. I've got intrinsic factor, I just am not getting enough B12. Over here, you have people that don't have intrinsic factor, that they need to have that supplemented into their diet in order to absorb B12. They could, I mean, it might be a vegan, it might not be a vegan, but these people don't have the capability to absorb B12. So remember, vegans have intrinsic factor, pernicious anemic people do not have intrinsic factor. These homies over here have to have an injection into their abdomen, Vegans over here need to have a supplement because most animal products have B12 in it that they can like eat, but they're not going to eat it because they're vegans. So that's what we're talking about with pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia is the failure to absorb B12. So those are these homies over here who cannot absorb it. It's not the vegans, but we're going to talk about them in a second. These are the people that cannot absorb B12 because they lack that intrinsic factor. That intrinsic factor is normally secreted by the gastric mucosa in the stomach, so these people have issues with that. So with this anemia, those red blood cells get huge because of the improper DNA synthesis. So they can be mega, megaloblastic or macrocytic anemia. So they can just be really, really big red blood cells. So the risk factors for this include patients who have like a partial gastrectomy where they have part of their stomach removed, if they have malabsorption, if they have chronic diarrhea. This typically occurs with patients between the ages of 50 and 80 and possibly because of an inherited genetic mutation. There are people who also lack the pernicious anemia, who, who have pernicious anemia that are vegan, but we're gonna talk about the vegans in a second. Diets that are lacking dairy, again, those vegan people, patients who have diverticula or tapeworms or an overgrowth of GI bacteria. So that's the pernicious anemia where they lack the intrinsic factor. And I dropped my white out on the ground, so I can't use that as my example, but I've got a bottle of nail polish here. So this is that intrinsic factor again. Vegans have that intrinsic factor. They just don't eat animal products or dairy that have B12 in them. So there's different types of pernicious anemia can be mild or severe depending on the patient. Um, vegans, remember, lack B12 in their diet, but they are not pernicious. Pernicious anemia does deal with vitamin B12, but pernicious anemia is primarily the patients who lack that intrinsic factor and cannot absorb vitamin B12 on their own. So the nursing intervention would be a drug therapy of intrinsic factor uh, a vitamin B12 injected directly into the patients who lack that intrinsic factor. 
there was a patient, um, this is really random, but on the show Downton Abbey, there was a, a p character who, this was taking place in the 1920s, there was a character who they thought he had pernicious anemia, and at the time, that was going to be like a death sentence because they weren't really well educated as to how to fix this. And the guy was starting to live life like, oh, I'm about to die. I'm just going to stay at home and be with my kids, even though his kids were horrible. And eventually the doctor figured out that it wasn't pernicious anemia. It was just iron deficiency anemia. So he could supplement his diet with, with more red meat and dark leafy green vegetables. And it was like, suddenly you don't have a death sentence anymore because we figured out which anemia you have. But that's how I kind of remember this. Like that patient at the time... He, they didn't know how to fix the deficit with pernicious anemia. They didn't know how to fix it, the, the, the deficit with iron deficiency anemia. But now, nowadays, like in 2019, if somebody has a diagnosis of pernicious anemia, it's not a death sentence like it was 100 years ago. We can give them vitamin B12 injections. Remember, the vitamin B12 injections go into their abdomen at first, and then they can have like an oral or a nasal or a sublingual thing. But at first, to correct this imbalance, they get injections into their abdomens and they have to maintain that for life. They have to have those injections of vitamin B12 for life. Now remember that's because their body does not allow them to ab absorb vitamin B12 on its own. Vegans, on the other hand, they're not getting vitamin B12 in their diet so they have to take an, a supplement. Typically it's like a couple of drops that they put on their tongue and they're like, oh we got our vitamin B12 but that's because it lacks in their diet. So those are the two different things going on with pernicious anemia. You have the patients who lack intrinsic factor that have to have a vitamin B12 injection for the rest of their life. And then eventually like they could have oral, sublingual, nasal, whatever. And then you have the patients who lack vitamin B12 because of their diet. Those are the vegans over here because they don't eat dairy or they don't eat animal products that could have B12 in it. They take a supplement that it's not necessarily an injection, but it's the vegan-friendly vitamin B12 stuff. So it's a little bit confusing, but just remember that it all deals with vitamin B12, but it, deal, it depends on if the patient has that intrinsic factor, if the vitamin B12 is going to be absorbed or not. So the last anemia we're going to talk about is sickle cell. You've probably heard about this before. I'll hold it up right here. Sickle cell actually deals with the changing shape of the red blood cells. I had a friend explain this to me the other day. She was like, somebody was explaining uh, sickle cell anemia to me and they said they held up an apple and they held up a banana. Or I think it was an orange. They held up an orange and they held up a banana. And if you throw an orange, it's gonna keep rolling because it's round. But if you throw a banana, it's not gonna roll anywhere. So think of your red blood cells like, I do not have sickle cell anemia. So my red blood cells are more like an orange, where they're going to roll and they can get through things. They can get through all the vessels in my body and they're happy and doing their job. But sickle cell patients, when they get into an environment that doesn't have a lot of oxygen, their red blood cells are going to change from that, I wish I had a banana and an orange out here right now, but I don't. They're going to change from like that orange shape, like a ball, to a crescent or a sickle or a banana and they're gonna like they can clump up on each other and get stuck and occlude things and block your vessels up and that's gonna cause pain so this is this is going to occur in like low oxygen environments so if somebody were to go mountain climbing in Colorado or like if they dared to go climb Mount Everest where there's really really low oxygen patients who have sickle cell anemia are going to start experiencing this stinging, tingling pain because their body's not getting enough oxygen and their cells are literally, their red blood cells are literally changing shape from like their orange normal state to like a sickle. It's, it's crazy. But this has to deal with abnormal hemoglobin chains. I'm going to read this directly so I don't get it wrong. Abnormal hemoglobin change. It's an abnormal beta chain, which is HBS. HBS is sensitive to low oxygen. So like when they would go mountain climbing in a high altitude area, it's going to change shape. In low oxygen, those beta chains contract. And so instead of it being like a happy little orange, it turns into a funky banana and they sickle. That's that sickle shape. It's kind of like a crescent moon. So these cells are now rigid and they can clump together. This is a genetic disorder. It's autosomal recessive. I mean, 
I'm not going to get it just by touching somebody. It's somebody who was born this way. Uh, there are some risk factors for this. Obviously, hypoxia, if they're dehydrated, if they have an infection, if they have venous stasis, they're high altitude areas, obviously because of the low oxygen, acidosis, emotional stress, alcohol consumption, high or low body temperatures, or environments for that matter, strenuous exercise, anesthesia, and pregnancy. So those are all issues, all situations that would put stress on the body that could change that HBS, uh, what is it, a chain, hemoglobin chain, to start contracting and be that sickled shape. So this is common in African Americans. I actually think there's a professional football player, or he might be a collegiate football player, that has sickle cell anemia. And I saw like a Dateline special or a 60 Minute special about how he trains having sickle cell anemia. And it was quite interesting. I just thought it was cool. Very random. So uh, the symptoms include pain, and it can vary with the site of like the, t the, the, the um, occlusion. So it could be like their hands or in their feet. They could have shortness of breath, fatigue, weakness, heart murmurs, jugular vein distension, a rapid heart rate. They could have a low or a normal blood pressure. They could have pulmonary hypertension, priapism, I can never say that correct, correctly, pallor, cyanosis, jaundice. They could have lower leg ulcers, abdominal pain, and low-grade fever. So a sickle cell crisis would include pain, fever of over 101, chest pain, jaundice, pallor in the mucous membranes. They could find it hard to breathe, have fatigue, abdominal swelling, headache, weakness, and change in vision. And when you assess these patients, you wanna assess the severity of like the attack or the crisis that they have. And you wanna review all the events that the patient like did in the past 24 hours. This would include like any foods that they ate, their fluid intake, the temperature that they, like their body temperature, if they had any fevers or if they were in an extremely hot or cold environment, any drugs that they've taken, any exercise that they've partook in, uh, trauma, stress, if they traveled on an airplane, if they drank alcohol, all of these different factors could come into play when it comes to the red blood cells changing shape in their body. So when you treat these patients, the primary thing is to like stop the pain. So you're gonna give them an analgesic, so like morphine or Dilaudid. And then you're gonna, there's this medicine called hydroxyurea. I'm not saying that correctly and never say this stuff correctly, but I'll hold it up right there. This actually may decrease the number of episodes by stimulating like a fetal hemoglobin production. This is gonna decrease the sickling of the red blood cells but it also increases the risk of leukemia, so they're trying to figure some stuff out. But the, the goal of this is to decrease the sickling of the cells so that they don't sickle and get caught on each other and stop flowing and stop doing their job of giving oxygen to the body. So when teaching this patient about how to work with and manage their sickle cell, you want to encourage to encourage them to drink fluids, specifically water. I mean, you don't want to encourage them to drink alcohol. Uh, that you want them to dress warmly in cold temperatures so that they don't have that shock of being like cold when it's 30 degrees outside. Have them avoid vigorous exercise and avoid clothing that can cause like vasoconstriction. Have them stop smoking if they were smoking because the Lord knows that's not going to help them. Get, encourage them to get vaccines because you don't want them to get like the flu and flu season. Have the patients seek doctors or medical advice as soon as they see like the first signs of an infection and to get genetic counseling should they decide to have a child because if they have another person who has an auto, autosomal recessive gene for sickle cell anemia, then that, pay, that possible baby that they could have could have sickle cell anemia. So with the nursing interventions, like we said, the first thing was to manage the pain you can teach them to get their vaccines, like we just said, avoid sick people, which kind of goes along with getting their vaccine, have continuous O2 monitoring on the patient when they're in the hospital, and for the patient to stay hydrated with IV fluids. So those are the different anemias we talked about. Remember just anemia in general, the decreased number of red blood cells, and then specifically with iron deficiency anemia, folic acid deficiency anemia, pernicious anemia and sickle cell anemia, they all deal with the red blood cells carrying oxygen or more likely like the lack of carrying oxygen or the lack of red blood cells in the body. 
So those are the different things. I'll hold up these little things real quick for y'all to see. This is for anemia. Those are the risk factors and the different types. We talked about those types. Things that you could look for. Symptoms for a patient who has anemia and then different nursing interventions. I hope I'm holding this the right way. Let's see the next one. Here's iron deficiency anemia. Those are the, that's the general overview. Those are risk factors, symptoms. Let's see if I hold this correctly. Those are the drug therapies. Remember, they just take an iron supplement. Evaluation stuff. They remember, if they're taking iron, they could be constipated and they could have some GI issues. Yeah, for that. Folic acid, it's much less. But remember, folic acid, they're not going to have those neurological issues. See? No neurological stuff. They just lack folic acid and they can take a supplement generally. And those are the risk factors for folic acid anemia. Hopefully it's not going to be blurry, but if it is blurry, sorry. Uh, pernicious anemia, we talked about the vitamin B12 and how people may lack intrinsic factor. And if they do, they're going to have to get the vitamin B12 injections. Those are the possible, those are the symptoms. And vitamin B12, remember, they have to have that injection for life. And then sickle cell anemia it is a genetic thing. Those are the risk factors. Remember, we're just low oxygen areas. Those are those symptoms. There's the assessment. Those are the drugs. Remember, for sickle cell anemia, it's managing the pain and then bringing their oxygen levels back up and giving them fluids. So those are the anemia, anemias. La, la, la. I cannot talk anymore, but hopefully that helps.